Hello everyone, today's video is a patron request. If you'd like to make a video request of your own, you can do so by becoming a patron. The link to this can be found below. Also guys, do you enjoy my live streams? I mean, I know I don't do them very often, but there's going to be a lot more of them to come here in the future, and I have some really important details regarding that which I'll cover at the end of this video. Stay tuned. From the fearsome European knight to the stealthy Japanese ninja, and even the beautiful and delicate medieval princess, the media has the power to leave a lasting impression on the human mind from our very early childhood all the way through adulthood. Despite seeing elements of just about every world's culture distributed throughout today's movies, games, and TV shows, there is one notable exception. Africa With the exception of Egypt, African civilizations and cultures in general have an empty seat in the media and education system. Despite the fact that Africa is the second largest continent in the world spanning some 30 million kilometers, it is the birthplace of mankind and it is home to 54 countries with over 1 billion people, 1500 languages, and 3000 ethnic groups. With such immense diversity in such a large population, true to human nature, a wide variety of myths, legends, and historically factual events have emerged throughout the ages. Unfortunately, with Africa's relatively low economic status and a general lack of interest in African culture abroad, most of these stories are left untold to non-Africans. Africa's presence in the media is thus reduced to nothing more than its wildlife or modern poverty, civil strife, or tribalism. Today we're going to cover 5 African historical events that I would personally love to see adapted into movies, video games, or TV shows. Bear in mind, by the way, that these are highly summarized for the sake of time. My sources will be cited on my website if you'd like to see more, as per usual. The Epic of Sunjata The Epic of Sunjata is a collection of stories preserved by Mande Griyos that collectively tell the history of Mali's founding and its semi-legendary ruler, Sunjata Keita. The story starts off in pre-imperial Mali when it was but one of several small and insignificant kingdoms. The father of Sunjata known as Maghan Konfata is informed by a prophet that he must marry an ugly woman whom he described as having a back with a disfigured hump and monstrous eyes that seemed to be just merely laid upon her face. The prophet claimed that Mali would become a great empire with an immortal name. His heir would grow to become a great conqueror. However, in order for this to happen, he must marry an ugly woman. Reluctantly, the distraught king seized the ugly woman and married her the same night. To make matters worse, their heir spent his first seven years of his life unable to walk, crawling upon the ground, much to the humiliation and embarrassment of his mother, whom was a widow at this point. One day, the crippled son told his mother that he would walk today, and true to his word, he did just that. He ordered the blacksmith to forge an iron bar for purposes that they didn't know. As he braced the iron bar to pull himself up, a very exhausted Sunjata Keita stood for the first time in his entire life, supporting his weight on a then bent iron rod. And true to the man that prophesied the great king or lion king, Sunjata would go on to defeat the Susu Empire and make Mali larger than any West African state that had ever existed thus far, and was only ever surpassed by Songhai. However, this is a reality that his father never got to witness. Amina in what is now Nigeria, there was once a group of states collectively known as the Hausa Kingdoms. One such kingdom called Zazao gave birth to perhaps one of the most powerful female rulers in all of African history. Born in 1533, Amina was a ruthless leader who was believed to have inherited the throne from her brother in the year 1576, despite other theories of the length and the timing of her reign. It is more likely that she was simply a princess and a war general, as her name does not appear in any lists of House of Kings. What is known with certainty, however, is that she inherited her mother's warlike traits and revolutionized warfare in the House of Kingdoms. According to the Kano Chronicle, she trained to be a warrior from a very young age and had the neighboring kingdoms on their knees paying tribute to her, including Kano and Katsina. This series of campaigns and conquests lasted approximately 34 years, including some of the kingdoms that lay far outside of House Alains, such as the Kingdom of Nupe, which sent enormous sums of kola nuts and eunuchs as tribute. It is also said that after each campaign, she'd take a new husband for the night and have him executed the next morning. The Askia Dynasty Next on this list is basically a real-life version of Game of Thrones minus the dragons and white walkers. The Askia dynasty was founded when Askia Muhammad Tore, or Askia the Great, usurped the throne from the Sunni dynasty in the year 1492. 
Within just a few decades, he would go on to expand Songhai into a regional powerhouse, conquering or surpassing all threats including the Mosi kingdoms, a recurring nuisance of plunderers to the south. He'd even go on to conquer lands from the Mali Empire, their former masters. His conquests extended the empire's borders farther than any indigenous African state before or thereafter. He also enacted numerous reforms including tax reductions on agricultural production and infrastructure, fueled by the construction of canals near Timbuktu. Education and scholarly were at an all-time peak in this region at rates not seen since the more famous Mansa Musa of the Mali Empire. Despite that, his family would lead to his downfall. Askia the Great had over 100 sons and as a result, the royal palace would come to be described as a den of jealous sons. This escalated even further in the year 1528 when he was old and blind, where he was overthrown by a conspiracy of sons and confined to a bug-infested island in the middle of the Niger River. This weakened the empire and the resulting rivalry and disunity opened the door to conquest by the Moroccan Empire in the year 1591. So, in this list I was very careful not to saturate it with anti-colonialism or European emphasized themes. However, I think this one deserves a spot on the list considering its sheer significance and it honestly surprises me that this topic is not more well known or discussed in schools or any media at all for that matter. I made a video about this some months back where I discussed the first regular contact or encounters between Western Europe and Western Africa. A topic that is not only seldom covered but just glossed over and summarized on the rare occasions that it is brought up. The first regular contact between Western Europe and West Africa marked the effective genesis of trade between Europe and Black Africa, including subsequent events like the transatlantic slave trade and eventually the colonization of Africa. These encounters first began in the year 1444 with several voyages funded by Henry the Navigator of Portugal. Considering these voyages took place within five decades of Columbus, it's easy to assume that the results and experiences of Africans were similar to those of Native Americans. You know, the usual narrative of Europeans sailing over to far off lands on fancy ships, effortlessly kidnapping and enslaving indigenous people, and making off with large sums of slaves and loot. However, nothing could be farther from the truth. Though this was the initial agenda of these early Portuguese explorers, they failed to do so. Rather miserably, actually. The first voyage was led by Nuno Tristão, where he sailed to what is now known as the Senegal River. Despite capturing a few locals during his first voyage, all future voyages were plagued by constant attacks from locals, who had seen what the intentions of these white men were and refused to let any of them near any of their kingdoms. In some cases, the Portuguese ships were hijacked altogether. Within 20 years, the Portuguese monarch had no choice but to form peaceful agreements with other kingdoms in the region and send diplomats to make peace in order to establish an economic foothold in the region. A policy that would continue throughout the centuries with the Portuguese taking a much more friendly approach towards future kingdoms that they encountered along the West African and Central African coasts. This is a true testament to the organization and foresight of an indigenous African states prior to European influence. And possibly, saving the best for last, we have the Battle, or more properly, the Battles of Dongola. The Battles of Dongola were two major engagements between the Arab Rashidun Caliphate and the Nubian Kingdom of Makuria. These battles took place during the height of the Islamic conquest, during a time when the expansion of Arab control seemed like an unstoppable force. However, the Nubians had no interest in being conquered by anyone and resisted Arabic conquest despite being numerically inferior. The reason for this is that the kingdoms of Nubia had ancient traditions of being fierce fighters, even conquering Egypt in the 7th and 8th centuries BCE. Additionally, Nubian warriors were regarded as some of the finest archers in the world, so much so that for thousands of years the lands of the Upper Nile were referred to as Taseri, or Land of the Bow, by the ancient Egyptians. This strong tradition of skilled archers was fully appreciated in the Battle of Dongola, where numerous Arab accounts of the war describe warriors literally limping home with their eyes shot out from arrows. A film, show, or game featuring a core of elite black archers would break all of the rules and norms of what is typically portrayed as the typical archer, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, pale-skinned archer dressed like Robin Hood. Even in Japanese games and media such as Zelda, this trend tends to persist. Not only would this be a bold statement that contradicts this norm, but its historical basis would have a profound effect on the worldviews of blacks or Africans in a historical context. In conclusion, we really need to place value and emphasis on portraying heroes and icons of African descent as most of our people in the mainstream media serve minor roles, negative roles, 
or modern pop culture such as sports or music. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with sports or music, but those are things that you just kind of sort of have a talent for. Sure, you can practice and train and achieve these things, but they're really more things that primarily rely on a natural skill or talent. And they really have nothing to do with our history, they're more of a product of the 20th and the 21st centuries. It's up to us to come together and make this into a reality. We can't just sit around and wait for other people to do it for us because it's 2020 and it still hasn't happened yet. We can't fully appreciate who we are without respecting and knowing where we come from, whether it be historical events, myths, or legends. These all have an impact on us, the way we see ourselves, and the way we see the world around us. There are countless other stories that I could have included, but for the sake of time, those would be best left for future videos. Also, as specified earlier in this video, I will be live streaming more often from now on. One of my biggest challenges that I faced live streaming here on YouTube was having content to discuss with you guys rather than just aimlessly chit chatting. This is why I decided to move to Twitch. A little known fact is that I'm also a gamer and gaming is where my YouTube journey first began actually, back in my teens. With that said, the exact same live stream discussions that I've been hosting here on YouTube will still take place. The deep discussions, the questions and answers, and of course, all the fun, but on Twitch instead and on a more frequent basis, all the while enjoying some really good gameplay in the background. And just to be clear, the YouTube content, the videos, all that will still keep coming, it's only the live streams that are moving to Twitch. In other words, I'm formally announcing that my live streams will no longer be happening on YouTube and will be hosted instead on Twitch and on a more frequent basis. And if you don't already have a Twitch account, I know it's sort of a pain to go to a different platform and set up an account, but please just show me the support, take the couple minutes it takes to set up a new account, and just bring all the same hype that we have on YouTube into the Twitch chat. Another thing I want to clarify is that subscribing on Twitch is not the same as subscribing on YouTube. Subscribing on Twitch is not free, but it's totally optional. However, following on Twitch is the exact same thing as subscribing on YouTube. So be sure to follow me there to receive the same notifications and alerts that you would get on YouTube from subscribing to me. It's totally free. After announcing this a few days ago via YouTube livestream that had 50 concurrent viewers, 1100 total views, lots of hype, nearly 50 new Twitch follows, and even 2 Twitch subscribers, I unfortunately don't really exceed more than 2 people chatting at any given time in my Twitch channel, and I spend about 90% of my time streaming with 0-2 to two viewers, and nearly 100% of my time spent with nobody chatting at all. So if we can get at least 10 concurrent viewers actively chatting on a regular basis on Twitch, then I'll do a special giveaway. If we can get over 20, then I'll do an even bigger giveaway. I'd really, really love to continue these great discussions with you guys on Twitch. And we can't really have those discussions if I'm the only person there. Be sure to follow me there at the link provided below. Thanks for watching guys, and I look forward to seeing you there. And always remember, we don't come from nothing.